It's a great pleasure to be here. We were just um, over lunch joking a little bit when I approached the building. I saw a lot of journalists going in and out, and I, saw, I thought, well, this is exciting. When the vice president of the Bundesbank comes, then um, we have all this, <laughs> um, this media presence around. And then I noticed, well, I actually noticed um, on my way from the airport, um, that there's an election coming up. Obviously, everybody, and this is what we talked about over lunch, everybody's interested in what's happening with regard to Brexit, what are the impacts on the Irish economy. Um, so I'm sure you have lots of very important things on your mind, and I'm not going to talk about any of these things. I must apologize, um, because I want to give you a little bit of an insight into what's happening in, in Germany um, in economic terms, and also what's happening in the German financial system, and more specifically with regard to financial stability. Um, so you may notice that, um, like I think the Irish Central Bank, we have an important role for um, financial stability, for surveillance of risks in the financial system. And uh, this is rather new to us. Um, um, we have a long history, over decades, of the, the, the Bundesbank, and this new mandate was given to us in 2013. So it's a new task, a new mandate, and I would just, just like to walk you through our analysis a bit. Um, so let me start. Um, this is way too small, you won't be able to see what I want to show you here, but um, let me explain, just to give you a, a bit of an overview of what the German financial system looks like, because financial stability, as you know, is really about the system. It's about the financial system delivering its services to the um, economy, and um, we want to make sure that these services can be provided even in times of distress. So. Um, it's all about resilience um, of the system with regard to shocks and it's understanding how financial instabilities can come about because you have um, large firms that are important for the, for the entire financial system or you have a high degree of connectedness or you have exposure of individual financial institutions to the same type of risk. So that is why we have to understand the whole system. And this chart is taken from our financial stability report and it's just highlighting how the, what the German uh, financial system looks like and what are the main linkages in the system. And you basically, if you could see it, um, <laughs> the print is, is rather small, but what you're basically seeing, if you just take this column here and this, and this row, um, and these are the monetary financial institutions, so mainly the banks, and um, they, are, they dominate, dominate the German financial system. I will show you another slide which makes that even more clear. So we recently had an interesting discussion with the, uh, with, the, with the Bankers Association, the Trade Association. They said, well, why do you always focus on the banks uh, when you talk about financial stability? Well, because they're so important for the German financial system. Um, that's why. So the banks are very important. Um, the, the households have very tra traditional um, uh, savings products. Um, they're also highly exposed to the, to the banks. Uh, life insurance is an important um, topic in, in the German public discussion also when it comes to low, low interest rates. I won't talk about these issues um, uh, because they're not at, at the core of our analysis right now, but um, that's also an important part. And um, of course, Germany is highly linked, and these are these um, uh, orange bubbles. Uh, the German economy and the German uh, financial system is highly linked to the, to the rest of the world. That's why also international financial linkages, and obviously also Brexit, so this, I found that this is why I found the, the lunch discussion very interesting, is very important for the, for the German economy. And so let me just highlight a bit more what these international linkages mean in the financial sector with regard to Ireland, because they're obviously the German um, um, financial sector is also uh, closely linked to Ireland. And what you see here are the, the assets and liabilities of German financial institutions in Ireland. And I think what's interesting is if you just look at the, the recent numbers, this is uh, about 2%, 2-3% of the total uh, foreign exposures of the German banks. That might look small. Um, but if you look at where we, were, where we were coming from, it was much bigger. So there was a, a much larger exposure of um, the German financial institutions with regard to, to Ireland. And then you saw a continuous decline uh, for the liabilities and the assets um, have kind of a hump shape. So, um, and you clearly see the effects of the, of the crisis. Um, so this, I think, is interesting in and of itself. Um, I won't talk about more detail here, but maybe that's something which is interesting also to, to analyze um, going forward. Um, as I said, the German financial system is highly um, bank-based. Um, so we did some, some analysis looking at the uh, 
centrality of different types of financial institutions in the financial system, because assets and liabilities and the linkages, that's one thing, but of course, um, it also matters how individual institutions are linked to other sectors, how those sectors are linked to the rest of the economy. So we try to get more of a sense of um, what are these linkages and, and what is it really important that we should be focusing on. And not very surprisingly, you also see, and that's the orange, um, the orange dot here, that again, in terms of this more sophisticated um, centrality measure, um, the banks are, again, very important. So that's why most of what I'm going to say is about banks. Um, but some of the issues that we have um, in terms of uh, vulnerabilities to financial stability risks, they're also very relevant for other financial institutions. Um, before I go into that, I would just give you one um, chart with the institutional framework. So how do we organize um, financial stability, financial stability surveillance, um, and how is this institutionalized? And um, I would be interested in hearing whether it's similar in Ireland or not. Um, so this is, basic, this is the, um, the, the organization of our financial stability committee. That's a new committee that, as in many other countries, um, was um, put into place and the legislation was put into place after the crisis. Um, it's chaired by the Ministry of Finance, um, so up here. Uh, the Bundesbank um, has three representatives um, on the committee and BaFin, which is the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority. So it's a shared responsibility, as you all know, financial stability can have distributional implications, decisions have to be taken that require um, uh, public ac accountability and that need to be discussed in Parliament. So I think it shouldn't just be the central bank, the independent central bank um, that is in charge here, but it's, it's really um, about also political accountability. So what does the Bundesbank do then in this committee? Well, we basically provide the analytical input um, this is not to say that the other participants don't have anything analytical to provide to the committee, of course, but we have a big staff um, in the Bundesbank, a department that, that deals with these financial stability issues. And then based on, on these analytical inputs and our discussions, um, we give uh, warnings and recommendations to national policymakers, and I will explain um, later on what we have done so far. So what does the committee do? What do we do in um, terms of um, surveillance of um, cyclical risks? Um, well, obviously, one of the discussions um, that was very important for the committee um, in the past years was what does it mean that um, growth has been weakening in Germany? What does it mean for the financial system going forward? And maybe I should just, I should just remind all of us that talking about risks to financial stability and um, uh, cyclical risks is not about business cycle movements in the data, but it's really about talking about extreme events, what are potential extreme events that are unexpected, um, that have not been forecasted, and how could they threaten the stability of the financial system. But for that, of course, you have to understand what are the drivers um, generally about um, real economic activity. And here's basically what um, happened in Germany over a longer period of time. So this starts in 1992, so you see the, um, the, the, the crisis, obviously. Um, but I just want to focus here on the, on the last um, episode, like let's say the last decade or so. And one of the features of that last decade was, was that it was exceptionally good. And that's something um, I will refer back to um, as I go through my, through my talk. So we had um, 10 very good years. And the risk that we are seeing is that, um, as we all know from our day-to-day -day experience, if we have ex experienced a very good period, uh, we might lose out of sight that also uh, negative risks might, um, might um, happen, negative scenarios might not be in our risk assessment going forward. So the question is how good are the risk assessments going forward um, of the financial sector and of all market participants. So growth has slowed down, as you can see here, quite considerably um, over the last um, over the last year. There was also there were we had quarters with negative growth rates, so there was talk about a re potential recession. What our economists are saying now is that we're, when it comes to recession, we are out of the woods, so to say. So we have low growth, um, 0.5, 0.6 last year, and that's also the forecast for for, for this year. Um, there's no risk of a recession in our baseline scenario, so in that sense it's good news, but it's also not very strong growth, and uh, for the, then for the years to come we're probably going to grow um, at capacity. But what is a baseline underlying assumption of that forecast is that um, exports are going to stabilize, because what you also see here is that 
the reason why we came in with a positive growth rate last year and also then this year is that we have very strong domestic demand. Exports in and of itself have had a negative growth contribution because Germany is so interlinked into the global economy. Domestic demand has proven very resilient. We have a strong labor market. We have like full employment. Um, we, have, we have a lot of uh, scarcities actually showing up on the labor market. Uh, skilled workers, scarcity of skilled workers going forward is a big issue for the, for the German firm. So exports down, um, domestic demand resilient, also because of good financing conditions. That's the overall macro picture that we're, that we're in. Um, the second ingredient from the macro side that um, is important for our work on, on financial stability risk is um, the low interest rate environment and also the market forecasts of uh, low rates to persist for a longer period of time. And this is a chart I'd like to show for um, a German audience, you're probably all aware of it, um, but uh, interest rates have declined globally. So these are um, uh, government bond yields, you would see it in many other indicators. There's sometimes a bit of a German discussion that this, which seems to suggest that this is a feature of the German economy or the euro area, but of course rates are low everywhere, so we have to understand the drivers. Um, and of course taking these two things together, so exceptionally good um, uh, growth rates over a decade, expectations of uh, low rates that remain low, well, nothing is forever, I guess, but uh, for a long period of time, um, that really makes us um, thinking about what are cyclical risks building up in the German economy, and I want, I want to show you the three um, issues that we have been highlighting in our financial stability report. Um, so the first is the underestimation of credit risk. Um, given that we had a very good period of time economically, and we're still not in a recession, so growth is uh, low but, but relatively stable. What does it mean for, the, for credit risk assessments of market participants, in particular the banks? Um, the second uh, vulnerability that we have identified is the potential um, overvaluation of assets, in particular real estate, um, and that's obviously closely linked to the low interest rates. And then the risk, of course, in terms of financial stability is that these the risks are correlated, so they're not entirely independent and they may, might, might get magnified in the financial system. And uh, interest rate risk is one feature of these, of these risks, um, and I will come back to that as well. So these are the vulnerabilities. Again, I'm not, everything I'm gonna say is not that um, uh, the scenarios that we are looking at are highly likely, but they are not entirely unrealistic scenarios. So the question is what's going to happen? What is the exposure of the system to these vulnerabilities if shocks materialize? A shock would be um, an economic downturn, which is stronger than expected. Um, it could be a rise, an, a hike in interest rates, so if risk premium rise on financial markets, as we've seen in, in previous episodes of uh, global un uncertainties. So these could be the risks going forward um, where uh, we see exposure of the German financial system, and I'm sure that other financial systems have similar, uh, similar issues here. And then the question is, of course, we can't entirely avoid risks. We don't want to avoid risk because that's part of the of the growth dynam the dy dynamics that we want to see. But how can we make sure there's sufficient resilience against these risks? So let me first explain um, what these risks are, how we try to measure them, because you can't. There, these are lots of things you can't observe directly, so you need indirect indicators, and then what we um, do about it. Um, so coming back to these. Um, 10 good years, or it's even more than 10 good years, because if you look at these numbers, um, which are the um, non-performing loans in the German banking sector and the insolvencies in the corporate sector, you see they've been on a trend decline over the past 10 years at least. You could extend this um, line and you would see that these indicators have been trending downward also over the past almost 20 years. So. Lots of improvement, good news, um, uh, lots of um, uh, good credit worthiness in the, in the uh, German corporate sector. Not very surprisingly, you're seeing these um, trends also being reflected in the risk provisioning of banks. Um, so risk provisioning of banks has been on a decline, write-offs have been on a decline <coughs> simply because the corporate sector has been performing um, so well. Um, the question is, of course, the underlying risk assessments and also talking about risk assessment going forward, are these too optimistic? So do we see that um, risks are being um, underestimated going, going forward? 
And again, this is something that we can't measure. We can ask people, how optimistic are you, or what are your risk assessment going forward, and we don't know what are future fundamentals, so we don't know what to compare with, so we need some indirect indicators. And one of the things we looked at um, are the risk weights in banks' internal models. And here I always want to stress that this is about financial stability, macroprudential su surveillance, so here I'm not talking about the usability and usefulness of risk weights for um, for micro supervisors and for um, for um, uh, the buffin for for example, but I'm talking about what can these risk weights because they're basically based on banks' internal model, um, the the um, risk ratings that banks generate internally. What can they tell us about um, risk assessments of these institutions? So they allow us to peek into a little bit the decision making and the and the risk assessments. And so what do we see? I guess, again, no big surprise. Also, these risk weights have been uh, trending downward. Um, of course, the models are based, uh, calibrated um, on data um, of, the, of the past um, years. Um, so, and the past years have been very good. So that means also the risk weights are trending, trending down. And um, there might be an issue if um, going <laughs> forward, um, risks are going to be higher if these negative scenarios materialize, then these risk rates might be underestimating um, the risk going forward from the perspective of the financial system, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second what that, um, what that means. Um, so but before we peek a bit more into what's happening in banks' uh, uh, credit portfolios, so who gets um, credit and, and what, is the, um, what is the distribution in there, let me say a bit more about um, credit growth in the financial sector. And um, what you see here is, um, again, a very long timeline. Um, this is starting in the 1980s. And what I would like to um, draw your attention to is here, for the, the orange line is again, um, GDP, GDP growth, which you, which you see, see is um, kind of tapering off. But here the, um, uh, what is this, the blue line, um, that's credit growth. Um, so these are growth rates, and you see that credit is growing quite dynamically despite the slowdown um, of GDP. So the, the latest growth rate has been about 5%, so that's, that's uh, even if, if you um, subtract inflation, um, this is a this is a relevant number, and it's pretty stable, and it's uh, trending upward. So the business cycle has slowed down, but the credit cycle, the financial cycle, cycle is still um, very active. Um, so why is that peaking into the, um, into the, the, um, this, the structure of, of credit, of, of lending? Let me just uh, highlight this, uh, this area here. We want to understand what's driving credit growth. Is it, um, is it demand? Is it supply? Um, we have interesting results um, from the banks. So when we ask the banks and ask, well, why are you lending so, so, so much? One of the responses they give to us is, well, because the German market is very competitive. So we have a, a three-tier structure. We have savings banks. We have co cooperative banks. We have the large international banks. And there's a lot of competition, which is, of course, good for the consumers. They get uh, good rates and good con conditions. Um, but it's, of course, one of the reasons also why there's a, why there's a lot of lending um, ongoing. A second feature is that um, the um, construction sector is uh, heavily relying on credit. Um, so, And we have a shift in the composition, as I told you earlier, away from external demand towards domestic demand. And within domestic demand, um, of course, the construction sector is very important. So, um, and they are borrowing. Um, that's that's part of their fin financial structure, um, and that's one of the explanations why here we see relatively strong growth. So this is just a growth rate of, um, of of credit that you're seeing here. And of course, we had periods with even stronger growth of credit, um, also with higher inflation rates. Um, this is the time also of the reunification period. I'll come back to that when I talk about the real estate market because there's also some. Um, interesting um, observations there. But just focusing on this area here, growth in credit and um, the construction sector plays an important role. Now we wanted to understand what does this mean for, um, for the structure of banks' loan port portfolios. So do we see a shift to better firms because overall the corporate sector is doing better as we've just seen or do we see kind of deterioration in in credit quality, so again, peeking into this credit growth a bit more closely. Um, and we basically find two things. One is that um, overall, um, the improved creditworthiness of the firms, the good performance of the corporate sector, 
is also reflected in banks' loan portfolios. So what we've done here, we've looked at the interest coverage ratio, which is, of course, given that we have low interest rates, um, it's, a, it's a moving into a favorable direction. And we have it here for 2002 and for 2017. Um, you could take more years, you could extend the time series a bit, you could look at other indicators. The picture would be fairly similar. And what we're seeing is that we're seeing the mass of the firms moving to the right. So the firms that are getting loans, credit from the banks, they're better, they're performing better, just reflecting the overall better performance of the economy. But as the overall performance of the corporate sector has improved, of course, some of the firms have also moved to um, financing through ret retained earnings. Profitability has been fairly high, so some of them don't actually need bank credit anymore. Some of them have also moved to the market, so they use market-based um, sources of finance. Um, so what's happening in bank portfolios? Well, overall, um, the, 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 we have better firms um, that get credit. Um, but we also have a shift in the allocation of credit to the, to the left. Again, this is not saying that the banks are doing anything wrong. So each individual loan looks healthy because it's, uh, the, the, the firms have improved. Um, but it's the relatively riskier firms in the portfolio of the, of the good performing firms that receive bank credit. Um, so from a supervisory perspective and also from the individual loan perspective, this looks fine. The question is, of course, what's happening if we enter into this unexpected downturn um, in one of our risk sen sen scenarios for financial stability? Well, then we might have banks being more vulnerable to the weaker firms in the economy because then the whole distribution of firms would again shift to the, to the left. And then we might see um, problems popping up um, um, in, in, the re um, in the risk um, portfolios, in the, in the credit <coughs> portfolios of, of banks, and this is something which we label allocation risk. So the allocation has moved to the relatively riskier firms. This is not visible in the data yet because we're still in relatively good um, periods of um, time economically, but it may show up, this vulnerability to a negative shock may show up um, in, in um, times that are less good. Um, let me move on to um, overvaluation of assets and loan collateral, um, another risk, another vulnerability uh, that is prevalent in a scenario with low interest rates when all the valuations are comparatively high and I guess nobody here in the room knows exactly what's the right valuation and what's the right long-term interest rate, but of course um, that's an effect you see across many asset classes. I'm just going to talk about um, real estate um, because that's the focus of our analysis right now. Um, before I do that, a brief comparison, again, apologies for the small print, but a brief um, um, comparison to Ireland. Um, so I also used the opportunity of coming here to learn more about the Irish economy. And of course, I don't have to remind you what the, what the risks and the social costs and the economic costs are that can be associated with a, with a, a bubble on, on real estate markets. And when you look, I mean, you just have to follow the line. So the orange is the, is the Irish line, the blue is the German line. So from this perspective, Germany looks very innocent, so there's no, there hasn't been a, a strong uh, hike in, in prices. So the upper left-hand corner, this is prices. Then the right uh, corner, um, uh, the upper line is um, row is um, is credit, and then da down here you have the you have household debt. So again, just follow. I mean, this, without being able to read the graphs, you can get the message. So Germany looks very benign um, in comparison to to Ireland. Maybe just one interesting fact, which is also not known to, or not um, reaches a level of awareness in, 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 in Germany very often. Um, of course, we, when we talk about um, bubbles on real estate markets, everybody would talk about Ireland, but actually Germany had its, uh, had its um, uh, weaknesses on the, on the um, real estate market. And here I'm talking about the reunification period. Um, so the 1990s, remember that I showed you the strong credit growth in that period, so we had um, after reunification, we had a shortage of um, um, good apartments and, and also um, um, real estate, com commercial real estate in East Germany. So there was a lot of investment going into that, into that area, a lot of tax incentives. Um, and then we basically created a, a, a bubble on the real estate market. A lot of employment went in the, into the construction sector. Prices increased, and the price increases basically stopped in the mid-90s. So then people moved out of the construction sector and uh, prices fell. 
Um, now we still have a lot of um, empty apartments actually because um, there, was an, there was an oversupply being created. So this was also strongly driven by, by tax incentives. So it's not that Germany is entirely immune. Um, you didn't really see the, the, the um, real consequences of that real estate boom in East Germany and the aggregate figures because the overall economic performance was, was, was better. So the de decline of that market, the shrinking of that market happened not in the context of the global financial crisis like here, but in a, in a more benign economic situation. So we are now certainly not immune, and um, that's why we're paying um, close attention also to the German uh, real estate market right now. <coughs> So if you discount how Germany looks compared to Ireland, and you, if you just look at the German data, um, then the indicators are actually sending um, quite a mixed um, set of signals. Um, so the upper left-hand corner, these are price increases on the German uh, real estate market. And we had um, high growth rates over the past years, um, in particular in the larger cities. And of course, that's also reflecting uh, changes in preferences, so people want to live in larger cities, they're moving away from the rural areas. And so in order to understand to what extent is this an excessive price increase uh, misaligned from fundamentals, we have to do good economic modeling to somehow try to capture also these preferences. Our economists are doing that, so they basically have a model with a lot of regional data. They try to understand what's the impact of income per capita and of the regional economic development. And if they do that, they come out with a number of um, about 15 to 30 percent overvaluation of assets um, of, of um, real estate and um, and uh, um, housing housing assets. Um, so that's a that's a number which hasn't changed over the past years. But that's a sign um, that we do have some overvaluation of assets um, in this particular area. The next question you ask yourself, well, if this is all financed by people's uh, um, own um, wealth and income and, and, and um, it's all financed by equity capital, maybe then that's not so much of a risk of a, of a credit-driven spiral of um, real estate prices. So how about credit going into that um, market segment? And I've shown you some of the evidence earlier, actually quite um, strong growth in credit um, going to the housing market, going to the, to the real estate market. Um, but then the piece of evidence which makes us a little bit more relaxed about this market and which also um, is the reason why we think that we don't right now need um, specific macroprudential tools being used for the real estate market is that, and now I'm coming again to the um, numbers you've seen in comparison to Ireland, household disposable income is, is rather flat and there's no strong dynamic in household um, um, uh, uh, household, uh, no, sorry, household credit relative to disposable income. So that's one of the things that we are, of, of course, looking at, um, but taken together, we think that there's no immediate need to um, act with regard to macroprudential instruments, but we're doing very close to surveillance. We, we do a lot of surveys also um, and, and a lot of interaction with the, with, the, with the banks because we think that there's a potential for loan collateral to be, to be overestimated. The two need, um, needs for action that we currently see on this market is that one, data gaps need to be closed. I guess economists and analysts always say that data gaps need to be closed. And um, then, of course, uh, those who have to re re report the data say, well, but it's costly for us to report, and so uh, why do we have to do this? Um, well, the reason is because we have very um, limited data on things like um, lending conditions, borrowing con conditions on real estate markets. Um, we have some aggregate statistics, which you can find on the, on the Bundesbank homepage. Many of this comes from private sources, um, so, and these are, this is good data, so no issue about data quality. But of course, if we want to understand what's happening in this, this, this market, what are the distributional consequences, where are pockets of vulnerabilities building up, uh, we need to have more granular data and we have to have it from our statistical reporting system. So we had this discussion for a long time now, so that was one of the, the actions that the um, Financial Stability Committee took um, to um, issue a recommendation to close these um, data gaps. And then the ESRB, the um, European Systemic Risk Board, also um, recommended to us that we have to close these data gaps. And now there's a um, consultation of a new piece of legislation which would enable us to collect more, more, more data. So we are on, on, on good track now, but it took a while. Um, and then um, we have now a macroprudential toolkit. So in principle, the 
um, the micro supervisor, the BaFin, who's also the macro prudential authority, uh, could use um, LTV ratios and amortization requirements in case our risk assessment would change for this market. We don't have borrower-based instruments, so debt service to income ratios, for instance, we don't have. So we think that that gap or this missing item in our toolbox also has to be, has to be closed. Um, let me say one more word about what we know about this market and why we are um, right now don't think that we have um, something like a self enforcing narrative on this market in terms of um, prices growing and, and uh, uh, credit go growing. Um, and that's new evidence that we have from, um, exp from uh, surveys of households. Um, so I briefly mentioned surveys of banks. So we're also asking the banks, what do we expect in terms of price changes in the real estate market? They expect rising prices. Households also expect rising prices, but there are two trends which make us um, a little bit less worried um, and still in this um, 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 observation mode, namely the following. So when you compare price increases that households expect in rural areas and in um, urban areas, then you see that they expect higher price increases in the urban areas. So just to take the one-year expectation, 6.7% expected price increase in the, in the urban areas compared to 3.7% in the, in the rural areas. So it's not that they um, expect huge price increases overall, but they differentiate and they take these changes in preferences into account. Also, when you ask them, well, what do you expect for the next year versus five years from now, um, they expect a higher price increase um, over one-year period, lower for a five-year period. So. These are things which um, make us think that this is somewhat linked to fun fundamentals, and, it, um, and they, 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 they don't ever ri don't expect ever rising prices. But it's a close call, and that's why we keep um, watching very very closely. Um, the final piece, and it's actually linked to um, the, um, the the real estate market that I mentioned, <coughs> is interest rate risk. So um, a lot of this lending. Um, on the real estate market is, is going through the, um, the, the smaller mid-sized banks, the savings banks, the co cooperative banks, so they have a very high market share in mortgage lending. And, and, but that's a general feature of the German um, real estate market. Most of these mortgages are fixed-term mortgages, um, which is good for the time of the uh, duration of the contract, of course, for the borrowing household, um, but it's exposing the banks to um, interest rate risk. And what you see here is the share of um, mortgage loans with a, um, with a, a fixed rate for 10 years. Um, and this has gone up. It has doubled from about 20 25% in the early 2000s, and now it's um, at around 50%. And of course, this is something that the micro supervisors are very much aware of, and they're doing a lot also to increase the resilience of the individual banks against this risk. The concern we have here is that there are a lot of banks, in particular the smaller banks, which are actually fairly important for the German financial system, the banking system, that have exposure to the same type of risk. Um, so we basically took all these three vulnerabilities, as we call them, together, underestimation of credit risk, overvaluation of assets, and interest rate risk, and we call this cyclical risk. And we discussed very intensively what should we do to address this cyclical risk and what's the um, need for, for action. Um, so basically, we, it um, uh, took us, let me do the math right, three, three years um, um, to discuss this. And we started basically with our analysis. So in our financial stability reports of 2017, 2018, we, we highlighted this, this, this risk and we also intensified our communication. Um, then, of course, we discussed in parallel, we discussed these issues also in the Financial Stability Committee, and we decided at the end of uh, 2018 to hold a press briefing on cyclical risk and also to announce that the appropriate policy tool, as we think, is the counter-cyclical risk buffer. Um, so just in, in, in short, what the counter-cyclical risk buffer is doing, it's not an additional capital requirement for the bank, but it's a capital requirement that varies over the cycle. So it's increased in good times, and it can be lowered in bad times to give more breathing space for the entire sector, because what would happen otherwise if you have this unexpected shock that I talked about, if you have that hitting the, the banks, the economy, then of course the, the capital requirements 
be them imposed by the market or by the micro-regulator would be tightened and would become very binding. So we are in this bad economic situation where all of a sudden a shock hits and capital re re requirements increase because that's when the risks are actually being realized. Well, what can the, can the banks do? They can't, profitability will be squeezed in such a situation so they can't just use retained earnings to increase their capital. They also can't go to the, to the market because everybody wants to go to the market at the same time. So all they can do is deleverage. So they can shrink their asset side to, to make sure that the um, capital requirements are being met. And basically the counter cyclic capital buffer is like a tie break um, in a situation like this. Um, so we discussed this and then we announced um, a counter cyclic capital buffer of um, uh, uh, 25 basis points. Um, so that's way smaller than Ireland, we're gonna see in a second. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the banks have fun until this year to com com comply with this. They, I mean, they've, uh, there's, it's, 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 it's not binding at all for the, for the German banking sector. So um, in that sense, well, you can actually see from the data, we haven't seen any um, uh, pro-cyclical effect. Um, quite to the contrary, um, the credit cycle is still um, in, in pretty full swing. Um, so what you see here, the financial cycle, what you see here, what is, what is really, and that's part of the discussion we had, obviously, um, where now we're moving into a, a period of weaker growth. How can you activate the counter-cyclical buffer? And of course, um, the response to that is um, that what's, what, what matters is the credit to GDP gap and that um, keeps on rising. And right now also the, the, the indicators are pointing upwards. So we will certainly have a discussion on this also um, going forward. I mentioned Ireland. I mentioned the counter-cyclical buffer in Ireland. And um, um, again, something for your, for your good eyes or getting new glasses. I'm, if you can't read it, I will explain to you. Um, so this is the, the, the buffer rate that is um, the, basically this counter-cyclical buffer is calculated. There's actually a, a formula, an equation giving in the piece of legislation telling us how to calculate the buffer. I think it's one of the rare incidences where you really have a rule-based uh, policy tool, but of course there's also room for discretion. And so this is the this is the buffer guide, and uh, here you have uh, Germany, uh, France is a little bit higher, and Ireland is up here, so um, let's see what, what the future will bring for us. Um, so just briefly summing up, um, so I discussed the counter-cyclical buffer, which uh, as we think is strengthening the resilience of the system, and also um, its aim is to stabilize lending in, in periods of, of stress. Of course, we're also talking, and I'm happy to answer questions on any of these other topics. We are also discussing a lot um, other risks, more structural risks um, to the German financial system. One is obviously, and I think these are discussions that many others have also have in the, in the euro system, and I'm sure there's also discussion here. How about climate risks? How can we, can we account um, for climate risks um, in the financial sector? Again, for the sake of time, I won't go into details, but I guess it's, it's clear that we need, also for, for this type of risk, we need sufficient, uh, re resilient and sufficient buffers. The final piece I want to mention is that um, I think our real economies are in structural change um, um, with different, um, different um, um, uh, structures, different issues that, that, that matter, but I think also the financial sector is in a period of structural change. And um, you just have to mention words like fintech and, 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 and big tech, and then it becomes clear what is happening in the financial sector. And I think the financial sector is important because it's at the core, it's so central to, to our e economic um, systems. And that's why we have to make sure that also st structural change in the financial sector um, works well. And um, what then people usually say is, well, what is structural change? Well, structural change is about entry into, into a sector, but it's also about exit from, from a sector. Can we make sure that these Schumpeterian di dynamics are working well? And we've done a lot in the financial sector. Um, sometimes I'm surprised um, that, of course, it's known for experts, but many um, who are not expert to these, to these um, I must admit, sometimes complicated policy discussions are not so aware of. We've, we have new tools for the resolution and the restructuring of financial institutions, and uh, we can use those tools also to, to help the re restructuring. And now comes my um, advertising block, if I, if I may, because there's currently a big evaluation ongoing in the Financial Stability Board. This is the acronym here, FSB. Um, an evalu evalu evaluation of the too big to fail reforms of the past 10 years, which uh, basically 
which are about a lot of things, higher equity capital and um, systemic financial institutions, but also about these um, regimes for resolution and resolvability of financial institutions. So there's a working group working hard on these, um, um, on these um, evaluations. I have the privilege of chairing that uh, group. And we will issue a consultation report in June um, 2020. And I would invite all of you having views on this, having done research of this uh, coming from different uh, parts of so society to, to look at this and to give feedback because I think it's important. Uh, we all know that too big to fail is an issue which ultimately can have um, costs for the taxpayer. But if we're if we're solving addressing the, the problem that can have um, huge benefits for society. So, um, and here I stop both with my talk and with my advertising block. Thank you very much. Thank you.